Hey dorks. Back in the 90s, I played with a lot of computers, even some pretty powerful ones. But there was always a classic computer that was inaccessible to mere mortals like me, the workstation. But what really is a workstation? With some exceptions, a workstation was generally an expensive computer that ran Unix, and then in the mid-90s, maybe Windows NT. The reasons for the high costs varied. Some were expensive because they were low-volume custom hardware based on exotic and expensive CPUs. Others had their high costs justified by service contracts with vendors that kept the machines as reliable as possible for mission-critical applications. When I say expensive, I mean expensive, too. Tens of thousands of dollars wasn't out of the question even in the 80s for a machine that would sit on someone's desk for getting work done. There have been a bunch of companies in this space. HP, Intergraph, Silicon Graphics, Next, IBM, and Sun Microsystems, along with some smaller ones I've never heard of. In 1982, Sun Microsystems built their first workstation, the Sun One, using a Motorola 68000 CPU. The same CPU that would power the Apple Lisa and Macintosh machines, as well as the Atari ST and the Amiga. Throughout the 80s, they continued producing powerful workstations used in movie production, software development, CAD, and scientific applications. To stay ahead in performance, they started developing their own RISC-based CPU in 1986, which would eventually become the Spark series of CPUs. Ten years after the debut of the Spark, Sun marked the occasion with an initiative to make affordable Spark-based workstations. The Sun Ultra 5 that we're looking at today is one of these machines. Of course, affordability is relative here. The bare-bones, no-option, slowest version of the Ultra 5 started at $3,900. That's 7500 in 2025 money. The Sun Ultra 30 was also selling at this time for $20,000, nearly $40,000 today. The costs were brought down by using a lot of standard PC parts. The case was made with thinner plastic, and the motherboard featured industry standard PCI slots. The hard drive and CD-ROM drive also used IDE instead of SCSI, which was the standard in higher-end machines at the time. The CPU was also a cost-reduced version of the UltraSpark 2 found in their higher-end systems. This one is the 333 MHz UltraSpark 2i, 2 being represented by the Roman numeral 2, followed by a lowercase letter i. Not to be confused with the later UltraSpark 3, with the 3 being represented by a Roman numeral 3. The cheaper plastics I mentioned earlier may not have been a big problem back then, but nearly 30 years later all the plastic parts of this thing are disintegrating. The fan shroud in here was in so many pieces that it was more of a concept of a fan shroud than anything else. I did my best to glue it back together so I could measure it and remake it in on shape. And here's the result. That'll do. If you find yourself needing a replacement fan shroud for one of these, you can grab it from my printables page. The link is down below. This machine also came to me missing one of the trim pieces from the front. Those big gray plastic feet dealies. Well, I have some filament that's a perfect color match, and I like symmetry, so I made a model of the other foot and mirrored it. Most computers use a battery to save system information, and this one's no different. There was a trend for a while to integrate the battery with the real-time clock chip, along with the storage for system settings. Basically, I used a Dremel on the side of the chip to expose the battery terminals. Then I soldered a new battery holder to those terminals, and this is the aftermath. Not pretty, but it'll work. Like most of my projects here on this channel, I end up using a blue SCSI. This is a modern device that emulates lots of different SCSI devices. Hard drives, CD-ROM drives, zip drives, even network cards. It's just really convenient to be able to have disk images representing different SCSI devices all on a single SD card. For me, it's better than dealing with 30-year-old unreliable moving parts. This machine doesn't have SCSI though, so I'm going to need to put a card in here. I was all out of blue SCSIs though. Luckily it's an open source hardware project, so if I want another one, all I have to do is go to their GitHub, grab some production files, and upload them to PCBWay. A Gerber file is basically the instructions that tell the PCB making machines where to drill holes and etch traces into a bare PCB. 
Along with the Gerber file, you'll also have a bill of materials file that lists what each component on the board is, like chips, resistors, and capacitors. The final piece of the puzzle is a positions file which provides those machines with the exact location and orientation of each of those components. Using PCBWay's turnkey assembly service, you provide them with those three files and their team procures the parts laid out in the bill of materials. Once they have all the parts, they place them on the boards and ship them back to you. There's also shared projects you can browse through right on the PCBWay website. You can find tons of open source hardware projects there or even upload projects of your own. I highly recommend giving PCBWay a try. After putting the blue SCSI in here, it's time to button it back up. Man, the plastic on this case is on its last legs. I'll have to do some more work later to try to restore the strength of this front panel. It's hanging on by a thread. Time to set up the SD card for the blue SCSI. For this I use a program called Disk Jockey, which is available for Mac or Windows. I'm going to create a 20 gig hard drive image, so I need to enable RON mode before it will let me do that. Then I just go to the Others tab, add the size, and make an image. Now I need to put the files on the SD card. You can use ISOs, bin queues, and toast images for CDs. You just need to rename the file to have CD and a number for the corresponding SCSI ID you'll be emulating. In the Sun world, it's expected that the CD-ROM drive is using SCSI ID 6, so we're going to add CD6 to the name of this file. We'll do the same for the hard drive image we just created, using HD0 for the type and ID. And now we'll copy these files and the blue SCSI INI file over to the SD card. The blue SCSI INI is a place to put optional settings if the platform you're using requires them. Solaris likes to have very specific information about the storage devices you're using, so we're putting these settings in here. With all that sorted, it's time to boot up the machine. It doesn't know how to boot from the SCSI CD-ROM yet, and our hard drive image is blank, so it's just going to try to boot from the network. We can head that off at the pass by hitting Stop A on the keyboard. Stop is one of those special keys on the left side of the keyboard. Now is probably a good time to mention that the keyboard and mouse here are proprietary. The keyboard has this bank of special shortcut keys on the left that can be pretty handy. The way the OpenBoot firmware specifies boot disk is through PCI pads, so if we do the command show disks, we can get it to list the available disk controllers. The one we want is B. When we select one, it copies the path for the disk controller so we can paste it into a boot command. We know our SCSI ID for the CD is 6, and I figured out that it needs to use partition F through trial and error. When you see the little spinning dealy here, that means you got it right and it's starting to boot. Here we're seeing a warning about our unformatted hard drive image. It says wrong magic number. This will go away once our hard drive is formatted. Since the drive is unformatted, the installation process is going to fail, but when it does, it gives us an opportunity to format it. Making a drive ready for installation is called labeling, so I'm going to label the drive here and then reboot back into the installer for real this time. The first part of the installer is the network setup. Now time to select packages. I'm just going to install the whole thing. Finally, we set up the partitions. I'm just going to use the default settings here. After partitioning is complete, it copies all the files off the disk onto our new hard drive. It's doing some post-install stuff now and getting things ready for the first boot. First thing I do is create a user account that's not the root account to actually use the machine with. Next up, it's time to install some quality of life stuff. I'm going to FTP some packages over to the machine. I'm going to use gzip for decompressing packages and bash as my shell so I have tab completion and history and stuff. So I have a few Sun Freeware packages to install. 
To get this thing on the internet, we have to edit a few other files. Etsy resolve.com to set up DNS and Etsy default router to tell it what our default gateway is. Let's install an era appropriate web browser to test our internet connectivity. That's right. Microsoft actually made a Solaris version of Internet Explorer 5. They also made a version of Outlook Express, but I'm going to go ahead and skip that one. There we go. Nothing cursed about this at all. Let's try a game. This performance is significantly better than I expected. Thirty-eight FPS in Quake. Nice. But what else can we do with this thing? I suppose I can customize the colors in the UI a bit. This is where things get a little bit difficult. There's nothing like the Macintosh Garden for Solaris. The software of the day is harder to get a hold of, and there was a lot less of it. This machine does have a few tricks up its sleeve though. Apple actually made an official Mac emulator for Unix called the Macintosh Application Environment. Its main purpose was to add a large library of software to a machine that didn't have native ports available to it. Let's check it out. Really simple install. I just selected all the defaults. Wow, it really is just a Mac in a window. And networking works. I can see my Apple Share file server. It'll be pretty easy to get software on here. Let's try some games. Oh, Wolfenstein works. Probably wouldn't want to play it like this though. Let's see if Doom 2 is any better. Oh. Quake? Dang. Well, it's a workstation after all. Let's see if we can get any work done. Let's try a Gaussian blur test in Photoshop. Ouch. 23 and a half seconds. Did anyone actually use this for anything? It's really slow. Let's run a benchmark and see how it compares to other Macs. Not bad actually. I guess it just feels slow since it's running on such an overpowered machine. Seems like it's faster than any native 68K Mac, but doesn't match up to Power Macs and certainly nowhere near the native performance of the Sun machine it's running on. Let's see how the native Sun version of Photoshop performs the same test. Oh yeah, that was much faster. One and a half seconds. So what else can we do with this thing? Dan from the YouTube channel Userlandia recently hooked me up with this Sun PCI card, which is basically a PC on a card, similar to all those PC compatibility cards available for Macs. It has a 400 MHz AMD K62 CPU on it. Let's try it out with Windows NT. And the Photoshop test in Windows NT. Two and a half seconds to perform the blur. Not bad, but not as fast as the Solaris version. How about Quake? There's no DOS here in Windows NT, so of course I've got to run WinQuake. 
Whoa. That's much worse than I expected. Weird. So what's the conclusion here? I don't really know. I just wanted to play with this weird machine and show it off. I wish I had access to some more workstation-y software for Solaris, like some CAD stuff or whatever. Messing around with Oracle just doesn't sound like much fun. Thanks for watching. If you're interested in watching me do more stupid stuff with computers, stay tuned.